Hi, I'm Peggy Farron, and we are live with the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Welcome to episode number 65. If you haven't done your Christmas shopping yet, and you probably haven't, because come on, you're a person. People procrastinate, right? Remember, you can get a gift certificate for anything that Understand Photography offers, which is a lot. We have a lot of different online classes. Um, and you remember our motto is we simplify the technical. We try to start everybody with the four weeks to proficiency in photography. It's a four-week class, and it's going to give you a good, solid photography education. You're going to learn how to shoot in manual in the very first class. And honest to goodness, it is really not that hard. We really do simplify it. Um, then we go into composition, lighting, including flash photography. And then the last class is what I call the techie stuff. It's metering modes and drive modes and focus points and focus modes and things like that. But you'll be ready for it by then. So that's a four-week class. The next class starts January 10th. It's, a, it's an online class, but it's live. So I'm teaching it. I'm there with you while you're taking the class. You've got homework and all that kind of stuff. We've also got some amazing software classes. Joe Fitzpatrick has put together a couple of Lightroom classes that are just so good. They're short little videos, and he really, really simplifies Lightroom. The first class is called Getting Started with Lightroom, and the second class, I forgot the name of it, but it's about the Lightroom folders, catalogs, collections, the confusing part of Lightroom. Well, Joe really, really simplifies it, because if your Lightroom catalog is a mess and you don't know where all your pictures are, you need that online class. So gift certificates are a good thing, and of course, you can also use those for one of our trips. We've got three tours coming up this year. The Everglades, Joe Fitzpatrick is leading January 25th through the 28th. He's led this tour, Everglades tour, every year for many years now. You know, we live here. We live, it's 25 minutes to the Everglades from, from my studio right here. So we, uh, Joe knows where to go. Um, and then he's also leading a trip to Apalachicola, the Forgotten Coast area, which is like old Florida. It's amazing there. There's a place called Dead Lakes with all these cool old dead cypress trees that are the size of trucks. Some of them, it's just, it's amazing. It's an amazing trip. That's April 16th to the 20th. And then I'm going to do another one of my ladies weekends here in Naples, Florida, May 4th through the 6th. It's limited to just three women. So it's a pretty intense weekend, but lots and lots and lots of fun. So all that's on our website, understandphotography.com. Okay, so today, episode number 65, my guest is Julie Lee. Julie Lee's images range from fine art, landscape macro, and infrared photography. Julie's also the immediate past president of the Orlando Camera Club, and today we're going to talk a little bit about infrared photography. Welcome, Julie. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you for driving down. Yes. Long yes. drive. Who could pass up a trip to Naples, Florida? I know. It's so beautiful here. So I agree. Thank you again for the opportunity. I agree. I love it. I love it here. Yesterday we were on the boat and it was, I don't know, 85 degrees. I don't know. It was warm. Yeah. It wasn't hot. It was warm. My friends went swimming. I didn't go swimming. <laughs> but I was like, this is December. I'm in, I love it. I love it here. Yeah, so. December. Where else can you swim? I know. So yeah. now, how long have you been a photographer? Has it been a hobby? Or no, you said you started in college, right? I started um, actually in my junior year of high school. I worked in an ice cream store earning money to buy my first film um, SLR camera. It was a Pentax K1000 oh and my God. Um, I was a poor student in college but I knew I wanted to take this specific course when I went to college that required that camera and I was going to be good at it before I started. And oh. So I spent the summers photographing my friends water skiing on the lakes and flowers and um, ended up taking a few classes in college and then switched my degree to business and computer science, I thought I would be able to better pay the bills upon graduation as a uh, business graduate than as a photographer, but gosh, um, 20 years later, 30 years later, here I am back in photography, coming back to my first love, and um, yeah, I think as I've matured, uh, my direction in photography has changed, and uh, yeah, I'm in my happy place with it. Ah, the happy place. Yeah. So, now, did you give it up while you were raising family and all this other stuff, or did you just go? I gave up the, um, I gave up the film, um, you know, processing my own um, 
photos in a dark room, but I've always had a camera and I enjoyed photographing my children and doing portraits of them. And um, as I got older, I started getting back into more photography, back into sports. My son played lacrosse for the high school team. And so I was that, um, I was the lacrosse parent down in the uh, end of the field with the long lens photographing um, all the sports it's going funny. on. And it's funny you say that. And to the audience, I have an article on understand. If you do understandphotography.com and then put a space and put lacrosse, I wrote an article about the first time I photographed my nephew's lacrosse game okay. because I was so out of my element. I'm not a sports okay. photographer. I hardly ever do. I don't really photograph birds, which is a moving, you know, I've just never photographed anything moving. <laughs> and uh, I had to think about everything I did. I had to think about my, you know, why am I having this shutter? So I wrote it all up in an article, and it's one of those most popular articles on my site now. It's okay. so funny. It's lacrosse. Yeah, it's the high same. shutter speeds and um, raising your ISO as the sun goes down, um, pre-focusing where you know the player is going to take the shot, where you know where the um, where they're going to take the shot from, if you pre-focus on that area, then your camera's ready when they run to the area and take the shot at the goal. So ah. um, I also learned to shoot with both eyes open. After a few narrow misses of oh. being down in the end zone, those balls fly 100, 150 miles an hour from their nets. So I learned to shoot with both eyes open <laughs> for wow. lacrosse. But yeah, my children brought me back into photography. Ah. And then it turned into portraits for friends. Oh, Julie, you have a nice camera. Ah. So could you take our family shots? So that, that kind of dragged me in a little further, and I started investigating other avenues. Now, when did you get so serious about it, like now? Because you're, now you're a serious nature photographer, would, would you say? I, yeah, I'm very serious about my photography. Um, or you're just more of a generalist? I started as a generalist, um, once I was able to reinvest in the digital realm, uh, I started trying everything. I went to Creality School of Art in Orlando, Florida. It's a non-credit type of um, art. They teach photography and painting and that. And I met some wonderful photographers there in those classes. We kind of created a little clan and outside of our classes there we would go and shoot together. And I started narrowing down what I, what made me feel, um, just what made me feel good about my photography. And, and I, I did a lot of um, photographing of people and some sports, like I said, but when I got into nature, um, nature and landscapes, anything that moves like water, um, macro flowers. Um, I saw you have just, a lot of flowers I on just, your site. It sounds very nerdy, but I was getting really excited about this. So now I've, I've kind of um, narrowed my focus, and I go back and I look at my images, and I realize that the photos that I enjoy the most are the ones on the macro spectrum. Okay. And with um, the longer lens spectrum, ah. um, I do I do some between like a thirty-five millimeter to. 70 millimeter, but I find that the images I enjoy the most are super wide or macro or super telephoto. Oh, wow. That's cool. And now, when you go out, let's say you're going out, do you go out with a goal in mind if you're going to go out and shoot, or do you just sort of like, oh, I've got some time, I'm going to go shoot, or? I do both. Okay. I do both. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll come up with a you know, we'll, we'll decide, well, you know, it's this time of year, the clouds are going to be beautiful, let's go to the East Coast and do sunrise. And, um, yeah, so then we pick a location, and I usually go to Photographer's Ephemeris and go on, and um, I uh, subscribe to Skyfire, which is an add-on to okay. Photographer's Ephemeris, and it predicts sunrise and sunset and where the clouds are going to show up and whether the sunrise and sunset is going to be wow. um, active. You'll have to show that. me how to use that. I, I, I that. got that and I'm like, that thing is technical. Yes, it is, it is very technical. Um, you turn on the sky fire. If you know you're shooting a sunrise or sunset, it, it's a very good predictor. You can go two days out or if you get the premium subscription, you can go up to four days out. Wow. 
And then That's sometimes amazing. that determines my location. Okay. Because the, the sunrise might be in St. Augustine, but then, um, you know, two days later, the clouds might show up down in the Melbourne area. So. And how far away is that for you? Um, St. Augustine is about an hour and a half. And then hour 45. Melbourne is? Melbourne is about an hour, hour 15. Okay. And a lot of times we go to Titusville. Um, I shoot a lot out at Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. Okay. And so we'll stop somewhere along the way. There's some bridges that go out there, oh, some I mangroves that. and that. You just need some. I need you know, to come up kind of there. Foreground. You should. I already invited myself with Reg Garner. I'm like, I'm coming up and you're going to take me on a kayak, on a kayak. tour. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, he's Although, the perfect person to go with. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I. I I lived in Orlando, and I don't even want to tell you how long ago. Because I, I moved when I moved to Florida, I moved to Orlando. Okay. I was a, I was I turned 19 on the way here. Okay. So I've been I've been in Florida a long Orlando time. Orlando was a fun place to be 19. Yeah, yeah, it was great. I loved it, but I ended up down here, and I love it here. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. <laughs> so do you have okay? So when you say we, are these just people you know? Other photographers from the camera club is how you meet your. Your I've met some shooting through, buddies. Yeah, some through Creality School of Art, um, and then about four years ago, I joined the Orlando Camera Club after meeting different people saying, "Oh, you need to join! You need to join! We have competitions." I'm like, "Oh, I don't want to compete. I'm so scared to compete." And you know, that's what it's about. But it's not. It's not. Um, our club in Orlando. I cannot say enough wonderful things about it. Our main priority is education, uh -huh. and. Um, I have this quote, and people get tired of hearing me say it, but you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And when I started attending Orlando Camera Club, I was exposed to all different types of photography and um, post-processing methods. And I'm like, oh, I, I didn't know you could do that. And so then I would go home and either buy somebody's book, buy a video series, or do some internet research and figure out how to do something, then I would go out with my friends and start practicing um, some of these techniques. And You've got amazing photographers in that club. I mean, really amazing we photographers. <laughs> I'm in awe, I tell you. But, but the photographers that are in our club are so willing to share their knowledge, to work with you, to, you can, you can bring, you know, someone that you admire their photography, you can bring an image to them and say, what do you think? And our photographers, they share, and mm -hmm. they're they're willing to help um, do a hand up. That's nice. That is nice. Yeah. So now, how did you get into infrared? I know infrared is not the only thing you do, but you you love infrared photography. I do. I do and too, by the way. I oh. Good. <laughs> do you have a camera? Too? I have an old camera, but you okay. know what? I think I'm going to be getting a new one because yesterday we went out on the boat. Mm -hmm. And I think I told you about the Cape Romano dome homes. Did you tell me you had yes, seen those before? Yes, I went out there in July. Well, two of them fell during Hurricane Irma. So we wanted to go out to see yes. them and photograph them. So we went out there and I brought my infrared camera. And it's a Canon 10D. Okay. That's a very old camera. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when it started getting old, I sent it to LifePixel and had them convert it. So mm -hmm. it was, it's been my infrared. We yesterday went to change the shutter speed and the dial just kept moving and nothing oh. <laughs> happened. <laughs> oh. So I think I'll be getting a new well, infrared maybe I can soon. help you out with choosing a, the appropriate camera. Yeah, that, I because I wanted to talk about that because um, I gave an infrared conversion as a gift to someone one time. Okay. And it had been years since I had my Canon 10D. I mean, I think I had it converted in 2004 or something or five. I mean, okay. a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So I went on the LifePixel site, and they're like, well, which filter do you want? We have a color filter. We have this. There's and we're so like, oh, options. my God, I don't know. It's like going <laughs> to the grocery store, and you have all these shelves to choose from. And I didn't know what any of them were. I just knew what I had, and they only gave you one choice back then. Okay. So now did you just get into it because somebody else had a digital infrared, and you said that's cool, and, or what? You know, I was probably, I don't know when when the spark hit, but I can guarantee you I was Googling somebody. <laughs> uh, Google is my one of my best friends, and I was probably on Google Images looking for, and like before I travel, I'll look at some of the more popular um, destinations, um, or the, the more popular um, 
photographic areas in my destination. Okay. And so I'll go to Google Images and just see what some of my options are. And I recall an infrared image of an area popping up. I'm like, oh my gosh, how did they do that? I know, and it's I so had, cool. <laughs> in college, I had practiced a little bit with a role of, I think Ilford made infrared film yeah. back then, but you know, it was hit or miss. I got nothing good out of it, and I just put it on the back burner, and I thought, oh, I, you know, I really wish this worked, but um, just really hadn't thought of it again. And then I saw an infrared image that came from a digital camera, and it just lit a spark and so you know Google's my friend so yeah. I started you know how do I do this with a digital camera and um, ran into some really wonderful photographers that were shooting infrared and um, I started off really basic with you know I don't I saw how much it cost to convert a camera I didn't even have a spare camera at that time so I thought well I'm gonna dip my toe in the pool here and purchase a an infrared filter. So mine was a Hoya R72, which is 720 nanometers. Um, there's another company out there, um, Singray, mm -hmm. that makes really high quality filters. They have two. One is a 690 nanometers, and I believe their other is an 850 nanometer. So okay. the 850 is going to record just a black and white infrared image where the 690 will let some visible light mm -hmm. through and you'll get some color mixed in. Oh. So I think believe with the 690 you don't have to use a tripod either if you have enough light. So that's the way I started is okay, with a so, filter. So the black and white one like the one I have is probably the 690. That's the or uh, wait, what were the, the numbers again? Um, the higher you go in the light spectrum, uh -huh. the less color you will have. And I believe color starts dropping out around 720. So what do you think I have if I just Probably have the... 720 or that was what I believe to be the most common um, conversion back in the day. Okay, so it's a filter that they put inside your camera. Yes. They take your mirror out? You know, I know they take the mirror out. Person about I know they <laughs> take the mirror out because they send you your mirror back with your. <laughs> oh, they get my mirror back. Yeah. Well, they yeah. used to. <laughs> I think there's an infrared filter in your camera. Okay. That blocks infrared light from hitting the sensor. Oh, okay. And so they take that out. They replace it with something else, and okay. you know, you're getting into the mechanics. No, I don't. Of, I don't understand the yeah, mechanics at all because you just nano stuff. I this is the first I've heard of this. <laughs> yeah, nanometers. Uh, a nanometer is one billionth of one meter. Okay. And going back to uh, middle school, high school um, science and physics. Uh, light is a wave, right? And um, the closer the waves, the more intense the light. At the um, at the lower end of the spectrum, you've got um, like laser and um, uh, X rays, and then you've got the visible spectrum, which is between 390 and 700 nanometers, mm -hmm. and then infrared starts at 700 and and goes on up. So, and then at the very end of the spectrum where you've got really long wavelengths, those are uh, more radio waves, you know, like ah. AMF and radio and that. So, you're so smart. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's about that's about the limit of the technicalities. So, it. when you so you got you said you just got a filter for you? I started with a filter and I just put it on the end of my lens and shot away. And does it come out the same as when they actually convert your camera? It does, but you have to use a tripod. It's like... Because it uh, takes away too much light. It takes away too much light. I actually brought one with me. It's the, the Hoya um, 70, R72, and um, I know this is going to be in a podcast, but I'm going to hand you this filter, and if you hold it up to a really bright light, you'll see that you can see if it's a really bright light. You can see a little bit of the light, but it's really red. It's like putting a 10-stop ND. Okay, because I can't see camera. anything through this. This yeah. is a really dark filter. It's a 77 millimeter, so you use it on a 7 set. That's the length, the width of your lens, so you just screw, yes. you just screw this you on, just screw it on to the end of your lens. Just make sure correct. you get the right size. Yeah, but there's a lot that you have to do beforehand. Okay, so. let's hear it. 
Okay, so if you're shooting See, because I don't know anything about this. I had mine converted, and that's all I know. Well, I like I told you, I wanted to start really slow before Well, this is a lot estimate. less expensive um, to buy a filter. The Hoya is around $70, $70, $75. Okay. I'm not sure about Singray, but you can go to their website and find information on that. Um, so what you do is you have to have your tripod set up, uh -huh. get your camera on, get your composition, uh -huh. set your, um, you want to be at about 200 ISO because the longer your exposure with an infrared camera or filter, the more noise you introduce into the um, final image. So at 200 ISO, you'll have good, um, good adequate noise reduction. And then um, you get your correct shutter speed your correct um, aperture and then I usually take a photo first make sure it's exactly what I want uh -huh. then I screw the dark the filter on oh, the, you do, you the filter on the front with my original infrared camera um, it was a DSLR so I was concerned with a long exposure I had to cover up the eyepiece because light would leak in um, oh, through the eyepiece wow from a long exposure, so I would have to cover that up, take, you know, so adjust you did, my you shutter speed. So you did, you manually focused before you... Manually focused. Before you put the filter on. Yeah, composition, focus, so get everything So it's just like ready. using a 10-stop ND filter, like Pretty you much. said. Okay, go Pretty ahead. Pretty much. And then if you want to change your um, composition after the fact, then, you know, unscrew the filter, move your image, or move your camera, refocus. What a pain in the butt. It ah! is, but I did that for two years. Oh my goodness, yes. you are motivated but and dedicated. But the more I did it, the more I, was, I just fell in love with it. But the thing is, with the, such a long exposure, if you have a tree with leaves on it, um, the leaves are going to move mm -hmm. in a minute and a half. Um, palm trees end up looking like paintbrushes because the fronds are moving uh -huh. around during your exposure. But a, a good Sometimes thing, that's a cool look, though. It, yes, it is yeah. very cool. And another thing, um, I was in I was in Texas. I was at the Alamo taking an infrared photo with my filter. And, of course, there's tourists everywhere. Well, right. the beauty of a long exposure is that as long as the people start moving or they keep disappear. moving, they don't show up in your image. Oh, so, wow. So there are good things and bad things. Um, but once you get a camera converted, then you can take, um, you can handhold. I handhold most of the oh, time. Oh, mine is amazing. I didn't, yeah, it's, it's just point freedom. and shoot, basically, almost. I mean, I, yeah. you have to shoot. Do you have to shoot in the manual mode if you're? I don't know. I don't even know because um, I, I just always do, so I never, I, I never I questioned it. I shoot in manual it. mainly, but, um, but I you think don't. you could, you, you could think shoot you can, in, in any other mode? modes. Um, the main thing that you want to do is make sure that you have your critical focus. And so it's best to have a camera that has live view on the back. Um, I sold my Nikon DSLR that was converted and moved to mirrorless because it has an electronic viewfinder. Okay. And um, what you see is what you get. So when I'm holding it up to my face and I'm looking through, through that the... viewfinder, it's exactly what I'm going to get. And with Fuji, um, which I've moved to the Fuji system from Nikon, um, Fuji has a, an option to turn on focus peaking highlights. Okay. So anything that is in critical focus will have um, highlights wrapped around it. And mm -hmm. as you change your aperture, you'll see that uh, more or less of your field of vision um, yeah, the we'll Sonys have that, I know, yes. because my friend Chris, who you're going to meet tomorrow, okay. he's the one who taught me about that. Yeah, it, it's a beautiful thing. He's so, a Sony guy all the way. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Oh, that is, that is good. Yeah, so that's, so now, this is your camera, this is the Fuji. It is. I'm pointing at mm -hmm. her camera, for those of you on the podcast. I'm using, <laughs> I'm using a Fuji X-T10, um, my, my regular... Um, color photography is done with the Fuji X-T2. I have two of those bodies okay. and when um, Fuji came out with the X-T20, the X-T10s dropped drastically in price. Oh, so so I, I snatched one up because I can use um, I can use some Some of my lenses, lenses on there. Um, the controls are very similar. It doesn't have all the optional controls that the X-T2 has, but for infrared I use 
it's you know aperture it's shutter speed very, ISO yeah and white I, balance I didn't need all the bells and whistles what about it, the white balance with infrared photography with digital infrared what you need to do is um, create a custom white balance and every time um, every time you get into a new situation okay but it's super easy I I have a hot button that I've programmed and when I'm getting ready to frame up my subject I'll press the hot button and uh, well actually first I'll try to find something that's like green White. grass or a medium toned um, concrete okay that has that medium tonal value to it okay and I'll set the um, exposure so that it's so that my I don't have um, uh, highlights or black blacks. Uh -huh. I'll set the exposure first and then I'll do a custom white balance. So I, I hit my hot button, it goes into custom white balance. I take a shot and the camera will tell you whether the shot was good or not. And then if it's good, you click OK. If it's not, you try it again until you Do you use you a, white, OK. a white card or a gray card to do that? Or? I don't because I don't want to carry it around. Okay. So you just find something. You don't I'm, white balance on the green grass, do you? Yes. Because it's, because it's, it's based infrared, on tonal is that why? It's, it's based on t um, ah, lights and darks. Okay. And green grass is kind of the medium, the middle of the spectrum. Hmm. It has nothing to do with green. Is that true with a regular camera? I don't think so. Um, I don't think it applies to just a regular on a camera. yeah. On because infrared, if you try to white balance on a green something, no, 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 no. So no. on infrared. It doesn't matter. The white balance, you can white balance on anything that is like an 18% gray kind of thing. Yes. Wow. But I know. I did not know Florida, that. <laughs> yeah, green grass. I'm, I'm like a little bit mind blown here. I'm trying to, I'm trying to wrap my mind around this okay. whole thing. But really, the, if you, like my, my Nikon D300S, that was my first converted camera. Uh -huh. And I knew before I sent it in that um, it may not white balance correctly. Some of the D300S's did and some of them didn't. I'm like, you know, well, I'm going to take a chance because it doesn't ruin your photo. It just means you have a little work after the right. fact. And if you're shooting in RAW, you should be able to... Correct. Always shoot in RAW if you're shooting infrared. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so let's go back to these different choices of the, con the conversion, the filters that they use inside the camera to mm -hmm. convert them. Because mm -hmm. they were too many choices there. Do you know yeah. about those choices? Um, I I have a general knowledge of that. So I, what, what 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 when you had your camera converted? Both of them were 590 nanometers. Okay, so is that the way they talk? On the, do you get them done at Life Life Pixel? Life Pixel. Yeah, mm -hmm. they seem to be the big people. Yeah. Who and, do them? And um, Kalari Vision, I think, is very popular too. But I've okay. used Life Pixel both times. They're Me fabulous too. people, and they seem I've been to do a great happy. job. Me yeah, too. I've um, never had a problem. Okay, so yours is the what number? Mine is 590 nm. So that lets meters. more light in. It lets some of the visible spectrum in. So you can get the color. I can get color. So what happens? The color's all whacked out, though, right? I mean, it's not like a normal They're color picture. A little, um, it's kind of fady looking, but you do see a little bit of um, like more reds and magentas. You see more blues and cyans, and sometimes you can get some green and yellow in there, depending on oh. you know what what you're shooting. But I don't look at the raw file as what it's going to be in the end. Hmm. The 590 captures so much more data because you have all these color channels mm -hmm. um, to work with. Okay. If you got the, the 850 nanometer, you're going to be limited to black and white. Oh. Um, pretty much 720, and 720 I believe lets in a little bit of color, but the higher you go in that spectrum, um, the higher you go in the nanometers, the um, the less color you're going to have. So if you're a black and white purist and the only thing that you want to shoot is black and white with your infrared, then go for one of the higher. But I want I I want pixel data, mm -hmm. and I take it into um, Photoshop after I've done some tweaks in Lightroom, and then if I want to keep the color in my final image, then um, 
I can do I can play with the hue saturation layers and I'll add multiple hue saturation layers and you know maybe I want the leaves to have a green tone and so if they're um, if they have a blue tint in my infrared picture then I work with that blue channel and I shift the hue saturation sliders um, over to green mm -hmm. and it immediately changes that in my picture mm -hmm. so it, it's a lot of fun in post processing because you have too. more you have more cool stuff you can do if yeah, you have color yeah. but can you take that color picture and just desaturate it and make it look like like the infrared that I know the black and white infrared um, yes but I and so the, the I, tree the leaves go sheer white still as long as you have sun yes, <laughs> yes you can do that um, uh, more specifically, instead of just taking the saturation slider and dragging it to the left to remove all color, you would, like in Lightroom, you would go to the HSL mm -hmm. um, portion and work with the individual color sliders. So anything that was red, you could darken it, and anything that was blue, you could lighten it, um, and just play with those color sliders, and you get a much more refined um, image. Okay. And then another thing that you can do is um, do some contrast and clarity adjustments, highlights, you know, you adjust your blacks and whites in Lightroom, send it over to Nick, um, Nick Silver Effects, okay. if you want to do a black and white. That would be a very easy way to, um, you know, especially if Give you're tippy-toeing into infrared, that would be a very way, very easy way to, um, to get an immediate um, satisfactory. Yeah, like red something image. really yeah, but cool. Right out of the camera, you probably would not be very happy okay. with your images. You've got to commit to um, learning some Lightroom and um, Photoshop. Now, mine are pretty nice right out of camera. Okay. They really are. Okay. I mean, okay. they're striking. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I always do something. I add right. the contrast yes. and things like that, mm -hmm. but but they have a brownish. Yes. tint to it, mm -hmm. which is kind of cool in its it own, is. but sometimes mm -hmm. I'll take the color out and, yeah. I, you know, but yeah, like you, I fool yeah. around with it. So shooting infrared, do you have any suggestions when you're out there taking pictures? The time of day when they tell you you shouldn't be photographing, like 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., when the sun is, when the sun is up high, um, you hear oftentimes, oh, that's the worst time of day to photograph. That's when you bring out your infrared camera. You need bright sunlight. You need On a bright. dull, overcast day, it's not going to turn out so well. You can still do it, but it's not going to turn out as nice as in the middle of the day. So yeah. it and extends your shooting time. If it's cloudy, the leaves kind of turn a grayish color yeah. instead of that bright white. Correct. So Correct. I know I, I, I bring my infrared camera to weddings because yeah. I still photograph yes. weddings and uh, it looks so cool when they have an outdoor wedding with palm trees or something yes. but then you know then sometimes you just have those overcast days and it's like psh, just leave it in the bag right. don't even bring it out yeah. <laughs> that was one of the reasons I went with a smaller camera body is um, my Nikon was a fairly sizable camera body yeah. and like ah oh, you know I, I have limited space in my bag do I want to take a lens out to bring my infrared or that so now that I have a small camera body I just you know boop, pop I'm it glad in my you bag said that because when I get my new infrared maybe I'll instead of having my because I have another old classic 5d that I thought okay. maybe I would convert that but mm -hmm. maybe I'll do like you said because when I went to Italy this summer mm -hmm. I carried around two heavy DSLRs oh my everywhere I mean, it was just so photogenic there. You, I didn't want to miss anything, right. so I carried those two so heavy cameras the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what am I doing? It was about a million degrees. It was so yeah. hot, and I had all this heavy stuff hanging off me. But, <laughs> but yeah, smaller is better. Yes. Smaller yeah. is better. I think the older better. I get, the smaller. I think that, you know, to me it seems like what the camera manufacturers are doing and what the consumers want is we want smaller, lighter, lighter weight mm -hmm. cameras, and we want higher ISO capabilities. Yes. You know, and they seem to be listening. And They're that's not exactly where exactly why I switched to Fuji. Yeah, that's exactly. I hemmed and hawed for a year, um, almost two years, and finally just pulled the trigger. I, I, I loved my Nikon gear, but I couldn't carry it around. I found that I was making, um, I was making choices. So I would go out to shoot, and it's like, I, I can't carry 30 and 40 pounds of equipment anymore. And 
um, with Fuji, I just I put it all in my bag and I go. That's cool. So you're all yeah. Fuji now? I'm all Fuji. Fuji all the I way. <laughs> yeah. Their image quality is is fantastic. I have I don't feel like I've I've left anything on the table by switching. Really? Yeah, it was it was kind of And the terrifying. lenses are they Fuji lenses? They or, are. And they're yeah. just as good you feel? Yes. Wow. Yeah. And lighter? Now was that a big expense to switch? No, because the resale on my Nikon gear was, was still pretty good. Okay. And I was able to um, I think I'm just even. You kind of oh, that's yeah, awesome. I think I broke even. Yeah, because that's the main reason that you once you I can't imagine switching because I have so many you, lenses. Yes. You have got some amazing lenses, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I think if I were a portrait or a wedding photographer such as you, I'd probably stay with my bigger gear, but I'm not. I, I don't need the weight. I don't need 30, 40, 50 megapixels to do the work that I want to do. So yeah. that was, I just let that go. And now what do you do with your work? Do you sell it? Do you I do. Okay. Um, a lot of it is word of mouth. Uh -huh. um, some people have found me through the Orlando Camera Club. We have a place where our members can post their photography websites. And um, I just did a sale a couple months ago to an interior designer. And she was um, she needed some Florida pieces to decorate an okay. office building. So I did that. Um, I do some nature and wildlife photography. I'm inching my way into some bird and flight photography. Uh, I find that there's a bit of a market for that as well. Yeah. So I have a three foot by four foot um, barred owl hanging at a residence in Charlotte, North Carolina. They had it printed on a, a giant canvas and oh, wow. uh, sitting nice. on the patio. So it's mainly word of mouth. Okay. There's a small gallery outside of Orlando. Um, it's called 127 Sobo, and it's run by the Winter Garden Art Association. And every month they change out their theme. And when they um, have themes that include the type of photography that I do, then I'll submit. You, we can submit two, and one, two, or none of your images will be selected for the show. But mm. I've I've shown and sold there. Um, oh, okay. A couple times, yeah. So it's fun. Now you lead workshops as well. I'm going to. <laughs> starting, starting to lead workshops. Yeah, in 2018, that's, uh, that's a new adventure for me. I'll be teaming up with Wayne Bennett Photography. He has uh, years and years of experience in leading photo workshops with GAPW and um, he's starting to do more on his own, and he brings in other photographers to work with him. So in March, we'll be doing a photo tour of New Mexico. I the, love New Mexico. Yeah. Where are you going? We're starting in Albuquerque, so we'll be going out to VLA, some of the missions, maybe a little bit of Route 66. We'll be going up to Santa Fe, um, Taos, out to Ghost Ranch. It'll be a five-day tour. Um, we may do an add-on for people that want to go down to White Sands ah, National Park. I did all that last <laughs> a year and a oh, half ago. Okay, well, I'll call you for tips. Oh, <laughs> yeah. my son, my son moved to Los Angeles, and oh. so his wife went out there first and got a mm -hmm. place to live. And so I said, well, you know, he had a, they had to sell everything. So I said, I got the minivan. I'll I'll take you. So we yeah. went. We went. We hugged the southern part of the United States, right. and that's when we went to White Sands. Oh. We stayed in Las Cruces for a few mm -hmm. days. And then I went by myself. I didn't come home. I went to Atlanta. So I went Route 66 home. Oh, great. So I, uh, I stopped. And I was in New Mexico for three days. And I hired um, Bob Ayre, Bob A-Y-R-E. He's mm -hmm. a photographer in that area mm -hmm. who took me around for it's the whole day locals. for 13 hours. Oh, wow. I don't think he meant to go that long, but he was having fun too, you know? Yeah. <laughs> we had the best day. Oh. I love shooting with other people. And uh, if you can hire a local to do that, I did that in Maui once and um, spent the whole day. It was before sunrise, and we ended after sunset and uh, went all the way around Haleakala. And now um, Randy 
is one of the top educators for DJI Phantom quadcopters. <laughs> the same. And, oh, yeah, wow. he just really took off. It was about a month after I hired him as a tour guide. I always hire so. a photo tour guide. I did in Tuscany. I did. I always do. Well, you maximize. And then people do for us. You know, we do Everglades yeah. here because we're here. We live here. You know. Yeah. You maximize so. your photographs. So. Oh yeah, because we know where to go here. Yes. I didn't know where to go in New Mexico. He sure did. You know. Mm -hmm. That's, I love, I, nobody told me how cool New Mexico was. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, are you sold out yet on that one? Um, we are not. Oh, that's We're cool. In fact, you I should go to New Mexico with Julie. Yeah. <laughs> Wayne Bennett Photography. Wayne, Wayne Bennett Photography .com, uh, workshop tours. There's, there's Now this is, others. this is just a general, I mean, it's general photography. It's not the infrared, because we're talking a lot about right. infrared. I just want to make that clear. Anybody we can go, right? We will have our infrared cameras with us. And but anybody that wants to come along on the tour, um, you know, I'm your gal. I'll, I'll help you along and help you be successful. But the regular cameras are welcome, too. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Lance Landscape, um, yeah. Landscape, All right, so. I'm gonna. I've, I got a little sidetrack because I'm gonna come back to because I'm looking at my little notes here, and I've got some notes. It says some lenses can create a hot spot when shooting infrared. What time type of lens do you use to avoid this problem? Great question. Heather came Before up with it. You, yes. <laughs> yeah, because I experienced that when I uh, bought my first Nikon. I thought, well, I'll just slap all my lenses on and have all of these options. And then I would take a photo. I'm like, what in the world is this? And so what happens? Hot spot. Well, a white spot? I'm not exactly like in the sure middle what or? causes it. Yes, it's in the center of the um, photo. Uh -huh. And what they think it is, it could be the coating on the inside of the lens. Oh reflecting light onto the sensor and the cameras are made for visible light okay but we're photographing infrared light and so the inside of your lenses are not coated to keep infrared light oh. infrared light from reflecting and that's what they believe it is but the good news is that for any camera that you want to have um, converted you can go online and Ask Google your friend for a database on infrared compatible lenses for the camera that you're going to use. And like LifePixel, they have a database for um, Fuji, Sony, Canon, and Nikon. So you can oh. just go on to one of those sites. You can even call them on the phone and they'll happily um, talk to you about lenses. Can you just try it? Will it happen every time or is it just when you hit the it'll light happen, a certain way? It'll happen every time. Um, it seems to be when you stop down. Okay. You're here at 2.4, f4, f5.6. At 5.6, you might start getting a little bit of a glow, but f8 and above, which you know, if you're in, if you're doing landscape photography, you're going to yeah. be stopping down. You're going to get the white spot. So oh. do your homework before so you, you could invest just, the money. But if you already had the camera, you could just try your lenses and see. Correct, and that's what I did. And it turned out my one of my telephoto lenses was the big worked problem. Well. Oh well, no! It worked well, but for infrared, I wanted to do landscapes. Oh, and oh. so um, I never, I've never had that problem. But I don't really change my lenses out a lot on my infrared. I kind of use one of my cheaper lenses, and I yeah. just leave it on there all the time. On my Nikon, it was a DX, uh, a crop mm -hmm. sensor. So I used the eighteen to fifty-five. Yeah put it on there and never took it off. Right. That's what kind of what I have. Yeah. And on my Fuji, the 18 to 135, which really gives me a, a wide range. It's, it's phenomenal. Sometimes I steal that lens and put it on my other camera as my walkabout lens. Yeah, but that sounds perfect. It, it resides on my infrared camera. But okay. I did my homework before I converted the camera. I, you know, checked to see which lenses would work with it. Okay. So how much, if you bought, can you still buy this? This camera, the the the, the one that you said down. went down in price. Yeah, it, this Which is, what's the number of it? This is the XT10. Okay. And, and so how much was the XT10, and then how much was the conversion? Do you remember? I don't remember. I can send it to you later. Not even a ballpark. You can't it, remember. It dropped probably two or three hundred dollars. I mean, is it like a two thousand dollar camera? No, or is it a five hundred dollar no. camera? I think it's around four to five. Okay. And then you're going to drop about 320, I think, in for your for the conversion. conversion. And really, um, t 
Tony Sweet. Oh, I'm yeah. sure you're uh -huh. familiar with it. He, he's the infrared god in my book. I just love his work. He's very artistic he and is. a lot of emotion in his work. Um, some of the the more popular infrared photographers may have a discount code if you go to their website. You know, contact them via Facebook, um, Life Pixel. Okay. Will, they offer these photographers um, discount codes. So. Okay. I'll look into it. Mine, <laughs> in fact, I got mine through um, Deborah Sandage. She's a an infrared photographer. She okay. actually wrote a book years ago. It's it's out of print now, but um, I know the name. I can't I can't think of. Uh, I know her name. She started with the Orlando Camera Club. Boy, do they all live in they all live in Orlando. Know, you've got to come to Orlando. Come elbows with us. I know, I want yes. to. Well, you know, Joe and I are on the speaking circuit and I don't know if we've ever have we ever spoke at the camera club in Orlando? No, we haven't. I don't think we have. I think well, we, we spoke we've spoken at all the ones around it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but yeah. All right, so let's see what else I want to ask you about infrared. Oh, I already asked that one. So yeah, I should look at my notes before I ask one. Questions. <laughs> it looks like I've already asked everything that poor Heather does all this work. <laughs> and I didn't even look at everything. I pretty much hit almost everything but the hot spot. <laughs> all right, so we'll go back to you. So do you make a living in photography? Is that your profession now? I don't make a mortgage payment with my photography. Um, are you retired I from, or are you working full time, guess, or no, what's your I'm story? No, I'm not working full time. I have a wonderful husband who supports me um, uh, financially, but uh, he is my biggest cheerleader when it comes to photography, Aww. and is, I, I couldn't ask for anyone better. And um, I think his dream one day is to retire and become my Sherpa, ah. and carry my bag. <laughs> so he's really encouraging me to, to expand my, um, expand my photography and he's behind me 100 percent and i just couldn't ask for anything oh, more than that so so nice so now you're going for it then i'm going for it and and i don't want to i i don't want to say no because no stops things mm -hmm. um yes yes you can proceed if you say no to something everything stops so i'm saying yes to opportunities such as coming on your show to doing photo tours with um, Wayne Bennett, which we do have, we have three um, coming up. I mentioned the New Mexico okay. tour. We have another one in May going to the Badlands Ooh. in the surrounding area. And then in June, I think it's the first week of June, we'll be in the Palouse region of mm. south e southeastern Washington State. Joe went in, um, I think he went in the summer yeah. and he loved it. It's supposedly the the Tuscany of the United States. It is. Yes. <laughs> and I just went to Tuscany this year yes. for my first time, so. <laughs> oh, it's so beautiful, so beautiful out there, just to see the wide open areas, and um, you can actually find a tree, they call it a lone tree. You can uh -huh. find one tree standing by itself. That's and cool. That's it's hard to find. It is. Uh, around hard. here, you can't find that. <laughs> it's hard in Florida. So. Wow. So anyway, in, in addition to the photo tours, I'm leading field trips for the Orlando Camera Club. I do that on a monthly basis. Okay. Oh, how I'll fun is that? Doing that through September of 2018. And do you stay in the area in the Orlando? Like, how far do you go for a field? Um, for the most part, it's it's a day trip. But mm -hmm. we have done an overnight in St. Augustine last March. We went up to Old Car City. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And we went to Providence Canyon in Georgia, which is like the Green Canyon of Georgia. It's I, a little hidden. I, who, I just, just, just found out about that recently. <laughs> I've never been it there, It is though. beautiful. You can walk around the top, or you can drive around and go down into the canyon and hike the trails down below. It's oh. Fun. Very interesting. We are so lucky to live here. Now, when I lived in Orlando, that was the best place to live for someone who likes to explore because nothing was far away. Yeah. To Miami, it's what, three hours, four hours? Yeah, about four hours. Yeah, you know, here it's four hours. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to get out of the state, it's only what? Six hours, five hours, six mm -hmm. hours. From Orlando to the state line. To the state line. Let's see, I know Orlando to Atlanta is six hours, so I think it's about three hours. That's crazy. About two and a half to three hour hours. Hour and a half to St. Augustine. Yeah. Hour and a half to Tampa. <laughs> well, it's we a great. Sunrise. It's a yeah, sunrise it's like, on the East Coast. 
have lunch back in Orlando and then do sunset on the West there Coast. There you go. So That's it's, it's a such a place great to be. spot yeah. for if you want to travel. I and I I, I love to do but a day trip here. It's re we're just down here at the bottom, man. <laughs> There's so much to do. Well, we got the Everglades. There, yes. And you can never, ever, ever get sick of the Everglades. No. Ever. I'm very excited about getting to see them. I've it's supposed to be through. a horrible day tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I might have to settle for a sunset. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, it's 90% chance of rain. And, yeah. it, and it's supposed to be cold. That's the hard part. I can handle the rain. Oh. I don't like to be cold. But for you... Yeah. <laughs> well, it was in the 80s when I left Orlando. So yeah, it was supposed to happen tonight. Yeah. It's supposed to go down tonight. So I we'll like see. sweaters and boots, though. Sweaters, boots, and scarves. But don't make me put on one of those big puffy uh, ski jackets. <laughs> those are in yeah. style right now, though, because they, they fold up small. Yeah, you can. Press I know they're ugly as sin, though, right? Yeah. <laughs> not, I don't like to be confined. <laughs> All right. So what? So let's let's talk because I think. Uh, what else can we say about infrared photography? I don't know. What's it best for? What is it best for? Crime scenes? Crime scenes. <laughs> Crime scenes. That's a, the... You know, I had a forensic yeah. photographer on my show, but we didn't talk about that. We talked about yeah. night sky photography, yeah. but he was a... That was they, his job at the They use it for crime scenes. And what does it do? It picks up what? Um, probably, I, I would think it would pick up um, human... I don't know. Matter, you know, like if there was tissue or blood or oh, something. Oh, I see, as opposed to up. the inanimate stuff. Yeah. I don't watch CSI. I don't so, either. So I don't but know. for me, who doesn't like blood and gore, what would, I use, what would I use my infrared camera for? Would I use it for... You can use it for portraiture. Ugh. It does beautiful portraiture. Yeah. If, you think? Yeah, practice I think they it. look like ghosts. Well, Their it's eyes get creepy. Call it shark eyes. Ah. Shark eyes because, um, because liquid absorbs the infrared light. Is that what's going on? Yeah. That's why the eyes go dark? Yeah, and anything that's living will reflect the infrared light. So if you're photographing someone with an infrared camera, you need to really just blast the light from a studio flash into their eyes. Or you could do a stylized, shoot, you know, have them looking down so that the eyes are not a part of the image or have them standing far enough away from the camera where or you could you know photoshop the iris in here all right what else Whatever. see now I, the only thing i ever use mine for are wide shots because yeah. i want the trees and, right. and i don't think that's probably 90 percent of the way what i people, shoot with mine i yeah. think probably most people with infrared right because yeah. you love the trees and the yeah, landscape flowers mm. um i've seen some close-up photos of, you know, roses turn out really beautiful. Anything that's ah. living will... Um, have you done much macro with your... With infrared, no. No. I have not. I'm, I don't, I've never seen anybody do that. I wonder, um, maybe it's not a good Google look. Google images. We'll have, to yeah. go, we'll have to go Google it. Yeah. <laughs> infrared, infrared macro or infrared see what flowers comes up. Or, or that. That could be a niche for you. Infrared... Yeah. Flowers, close-ups, because you got all those close-ups of flowers that are so pretty. I don't know. I'm. How about infrared bugs? I wonder what they would turn out like. I don't know. And I don't like to photograph you know, that's bugs. That's the key to creativity, though. Is you ask yourself a question: What if? Yeah. What if? And you know, you just never know what road you're going to go down if you answer that question. Yeah. What if I do I, this? I think bugs might be cool, but I don't like bugs. Yeah. I live in Florida. There's enough bugs. And people like to monstrous photograph them. Why do they like to <laughs> photograph them? They're creepy. <laughs> I'll stick with birds and butterflies. Butterflies are about as buggy as I go. Butterflies. But I wonder what would happen if you photographed butterflies close up with an infrared camera. I don't know. I'll try it. Now, now when you use the, because you like your long lens, and I wonder, does it make much difference, your infrared images would it make a difference because I always shoot with a wide lens with my infrared so that I can get all the trees and all that other stuff there's no difference in the look it's just you're getting closer is am Correct. I right if you're using a long lens Correct. Um, you do want you might to not use, have as much light though you want to check especially on your um, live view to make sure you're in focus because the further you zoom in or zoom out the infrared light focuses on a different plane than RGB light does. So okay. your lenses are built for RGB light so mm -hmm. that it 
um, it comes through the lens and that lens will focus the RGB light on and all at the same point on your sensor. Mm -hmm. Infrared light can focus in front of that point or in back of that point based on how many millimeters you are out. So I always use live view, but the, so beauty, no. oh, go ahead. The, the beauty of the electronic viewfinder is that I can have it up to my face. I'm not looking on the screen. I can have it up to my face and then I'm just tweaking the um, can focus. You, can you, z okay, so when we use live view, to focus, we zoom in to see if something's in focus. Mm -hmm. Can you do that when the camera's up to your eyeball in your viewfinder? With no. my Fuji, I can. You can. Because it's an electronic viewfinder. But you can zoom in. You're looking via the sensor. So you're not, you're not actually zooming in on the, ca on the picture, but you're zooming in mm -hmm. on, on what are you zooming in on? <laughs> on your focus point. But you can look at it even though your picture's still framed. Correct. Like if you want the whole flower, this is your framing. Yes. And then you can zoom in even though you're not and changing your lens. Correct. That's cool. Yeah, I just push a button, it goes in 100%. I fine tune the focus and then I take my That's shot. really cool. It's a beautiful thing. That's a yes. good, good option on that thing. Because mm -hmm. I don't, on live view, you have to do it on the back of the camera on yeah, mine. And you can plus, 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 plus. Right, and, that's what you, you have know, to do. It's, it's not always easy though. No. And you're that sounds your easier. Around and then yes, and okay. you're on yes. I'm gonna be looking into a Fuji when it's I get just, out of here. <laughs> or, or mirror, you know, any mirrorless. And if you go on LifePixel's website, they'll actually recommend certain cameras. Oh, for oh, for, for digital infrared. Um, for the mirrorless. Okay. Um, some that they prefer to the, that have better results, and others that are not quite so good. They'll talk about that on their website. Yeah, they've got a really good website too. I have a couple friends that just have um, pocket cameras. Yeah, I saw that, that they, I don't know if they still do, but they used, they, when I was, I bought, remember I told you a few years ago, I bought a conversion as a gift for right. somebody. And they had, they were actually selling some little point and shoot. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they still do at Life Pixel. I believe they did. But they, they did. did. They had, yeah. you could just buy the whole thing. Yeah. They're actually um, converting brand new cameras now. You can buy it yourself and have it shipped directly to them, or they, on their website, they'll have some brand new cameras in stock already converted, and then you don't even have to wait um, for, you know, to right. get in line once your camera gets there to have it converted. They have it ready to ship to you. So wow. it's a beautiful it's thing. It's so it's, fun though. It the is the fun. images are well, the very first art sale, art show I ever did. Um, I live in this or my not I don't live here. My studio is in this area called uh, in the Bayshore redevelopment area. Okay. So they're trying to make the Bayshore area like this artsy place. Oh great. So they had this you know, big art fair, and they gave us, everything was free if you lived in the, or not, I keep saying live, I don't live at my studio, <laughs> but if you owned property in the Bayshore right. area, and uh, it was a long time ago, but uh, I was, you know, I'm looking, I'm like, I don't have any art, I've got, you know, I've been, I, it was probably 2009, I'm going to mm -hmm. say, because I, I'm, you know, I'm a working photographer. Yeah. I make right. money taking pictures of people. You can't right. sell pictures of people. They don't like that. <laughs> so I went out with my infrared on one hip and my, mm -hmm. my uh, fisheye on the other hip. Great. And it was a freezing cold day. And I went out with my little nephew. He was about, I don't know, how old is he? He's 19. So he was, how old was he then? He was 11 or something. Mm -hmm. And we went all over and just took a bunch of pictures. And I took just plain palm trees and infrared mm -hmm. and I put them in these cute little frames and yeah. I made a few hundred bucks yes. on those infrared yes. pictures. I was so <laughs> excited. And my fish I got a couple, a couple yeah. small. I didn't sell anything big. <laughs> but I actually made money on my very first show yeah. just because it didn't cost me any. It cost me money because I had to get everything printed but mm -hmm. I I was so excited. My very my first infrared session. images are what sell at the um, Winter Garden. That's gallery. what people like. They're so they unique. It. It's so unique. Um, and palm trees look so cool yeah. in, in infrared. Yeah. I'm going to tell you a quick story. We went up to Dead Lake. Have you been to Dead Lakes? I was there last weekend. Oh my God! In fact, if you go to my website, I've been posting pictures this week of some of the trees on Dead Lakes. It is so. Did you go with cool. um, what's his name? The guy who does the boat tours on Matt. Is it Matt? Matt Godwin? Matt Godwin? 
Yeah. Yes. Yes. He's awesome. He is, and, and he knows everything about He the knows area. everything. He sent us to a little restaurant for um, fingerling catfish afterwards. He sent us down the road to get some Tupelo honey. We did the honey the tasting because yes. he sent us there too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's super. He, we loved him. Just he got up before sunrise for us because we wanted mm -hmm. to get there at sunrise, and it was a horrible day. Oh. It was gloomy. It was raining a little bit. It was a horrible day. So anyway, he's dropping us off at you know, early, it was like 9.30 or 10 o'clock or something in the morning, he's dropping us off. And he said, oh, I'm going back at noon with the guy with an infrared camera. Well, Joe lost his mind and he's, been, he's still mad at me, I think, because he's like, we need to go back, we need to go back and we need to go again, you know? I'm like, no, we don't have time, we have to do it. <laughs> you wanna go back there with the infrared because dead lakes in the middle of the day, that would be amazing. Oh, it was like glass when we were there. There were perfect mirrors in the, um, there were very few fishing boats, you know, they went by, but we'd, he'd turn the pontoon boat off and we would just sit there for a while and the, the water would clear out. And I did shoot with my um, regular color camera as well as infrared. Yeah. The only thing I've processed so far is the infrared. Because I'm it's jealous. So interesting. And Joe's really jealous, I can tell you. I can feel the, I can feel the green envy <laughs> all the way from here. <laughs> well, we didn't have clouds in the sky. I, I oh. was really hoping for clouds. It was very clouds cloudy when awesome. we showed up. But when we got out there, the clouds were gone. So what I did in my post-processing, um, I, I did a channel swap of the red and blue channels and was able to, um, I've got some coming up that will have a really bright blue sky with the white um, foliage and trunks. I haven't posted those yet. But I also took, um, before I channel swapped, I took the red and just drugged the red slider down in the the black and white. I did a black and white layer mm -hmm. in Photoshop, and I took the red slider and uh, red and magenta, and just drug them to the left and really darkened down the sky and the the infrared tree trunks and foliage and the reflections just glowed from the water. And those are on my website oh, now. My so God, I'm so I'm yeah. jealous, man. Yeah. Well, you know, Joe. Well, well Joe's leading yeah. that trip in April. Okay, and, he, and you're I, going too. Maybe. Yeah, you should. I want you to. Should. I yeah. want to. But we limit our trips to only five photographers. Oh, okay. And we, we bought a minivan for that reason. Six okay. people fit very comfortably. Yeah. Seven people can fit, but it's not comfortable. Yeah. So we don't, we don't do seven people. We do six. We do five plus the leader. So okay. if I don't sell out, I'll go. Okay. If we do, Maybe you'll have a I'll, new I'll, camera by then. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what's, yeah. what's next for you? Next for There's me. your tours. You yeah. already told us. Yeah, the, I kind of well, got all backwards tours, on my. And I'm also teaching a. Um, I'm doing a, a small photo tour at the Orlando Wetlands Festival. Um, it's just outside of Orlando, near Christmas, Florida. Okay. And it's it's actually um, where the city of Orlando sends their treated water to filter through plant vegetation to take all the nitrogen out of the water but they've allowed Friends of Orlando Wetlands to um, do let photographers go out there and people that want to see wildlife. We get a lot of um, migratory birds and a lot of birds that are there all year long. So I'll be doing one of the photo tours there with um, Vinnie Colucci and um, oh, they have a resident photographer that is an expert in bird photography. Okay. So I'll be doing that on February 17th at the Orlando Wetlands Festival. Orlando Wetlands Fest Festival. Mm -hmm. And what's your website? Uh, JulieLeePhoto.com. Okay. And I have galleries on um, 500px.com slash Julie Lee. And my Instagram is at Julie Lee USA. USA. <laughs> There's so many Julie Lees out there. Oh no. That's <laughs> why yeah, so I put a little USA after that. There you so. go. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. All of that is going to be, we're going to have all the links to everything Julie just said and more in the show notes on understandphotography.com. Um, and you can see other shows on our website. You can see some of the articles. You can look up that lacrosse article I told you about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
it's really good art. It's a good article, especially if you're just learning to shoot in the manual mode, because it goes through my whole thought process. I'm like, why? Okay, I want this shutter speed, but it's a little too slow, and why is it a little too slow, and that kind of stuff. So it's a good article. Next week on the Understand Photography Show, I'm going to have a fabulous guest. He's a Nikon ambassador, professional photographer Mike Corrado. He's a great speaker, and he's he's a great, he's just He's so smart, and he has so much energy. He has all these cool projects. So we're going to talk to Mike Corrado next week on the Understand Photography Show. If you want to watch us live, we're here on Facebook. It's facebook.com slash understandphotography. We are live at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, and then we put this on YouTube. So our YouTube channel and our iTunes channel is the understand photography show so do a search and subscribe and make comments and nice comments please <laughs> there's a lot of haters on the internet have you noticed yes. that <laughs> anyway make comments subscribe and thank you so much for listening watching thank you julie for coming thank you so much for having me today peggy and i'm peggy farron thank you for watching episode number 65 of the understand photography show we'll see you next week we hope you enjoyed this episode of the Understand Photography Show. It would help us immensely if you would click like down below and subscribe to our channel. Thanks so much. We really want to continue to bring awesome photographers onto the Understand Photography Show.